I'd like to welcome everyone out to the service this evening, and we welcome back as our preacher this evening, Reverend Paul Fitzsimons, who is the minister in Mulligan's Free Presbyterian Church. Remember the children's meeting tomorrow night, Monday night at 7 p.m., and on Thursday at 8 p.m. is the Bible study and prayer meeting, and the Reverend Lecky will take that meeting. Next Lord's Day, the services at the usual times of 11:30 and 7. And the preacher will be the Reverend Jonathan Crean, who's the minister in Convoy Free Presbyterian Church. Again, I'd like to thank God's servant for those warm words of welcome. It's good to be back again. It's always good to see people come back to hear you preach. Uh, it's always a surprise, but nonetheless a welcome surprise. Uh, we trust the Lord will bless us tonight as we gather together around God's word. I want to thank you all for having me here today. It's been a privilege and honor to be here. Uh, I want to thank my host and hostesses uh, also for catering for me. And I'm well fed, well watered. And if I were sitting where you are sitting, I might be finding it difficult to keep my my eyes open tonight because we've had so much, uh, but I can't fall asleep or else I'll fall out of the pulpit. Uh, but we do trust that the Lord will bless you here in Six Mile Cross, uh, that you'll know a visitation from God in the new year that lies ahead, that the Lord will come in great power, save souls, bless his children, and that God will meet your every need according to his riches in glory. We're turning to the hymn 203 in your hymn book. I was sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more, overwhelmed by guilt within mercy, I did implore. 203, and let's stand and sing our very best unto the Lord this evening.
Well, let's all unite our hearts together once again at the throne of heavenly grace and seek God's blessing and the Lord's presence in our service here tonight. Let's all pray. Our gracious God and our eternal Father in heaven, we thank thee for the loving kindness of God. We thank thee for the Lord who has loved his people with an everlasting love and how he with loving kindness drew us unto himself. And we do pray that thou would draw sinners to Christ tonight, that thou would reveal something of the Savior's great love for them. We thank thee for Calvary. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us, who gave himself for us, to wash us from our sins in his own precious atoning blood. We thank thee for the love of God the Father, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, Lord, we realize that there are many souls, and they are in real danger of perishing in their sins, of going headlong into Christ's rejecter's hell, suffering everlasting punishment throughout the endless ages of eternity. And, O oh God, we pray that some man or woman, some young person, some soul perhaps in this house tonight or listening online will close in with God's offer of mercy, flee from the wrath that is to come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ freely offered to them in the gospel. We do thank thee for the amazing grace of God. We thank thee for the uh, glorious plan of redemption. We do rejoice that from before the foundation of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ promised to come into this world, to become truly man, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, that he might bear away our sin in his own body on that middle tree. We thank thee for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. We thank thee for our sinless Savior, the one who always did those things that pleased his Father in heaven, the one who delighted perfectly in the law of God, the one who fulfilled all righteousness on our behalf, the one who was obedient, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we thank thee the moment a sinner believes in Jesus Christ, not only does Christ wash away their sin in his own precious atoning blood, but Christ clothes them with his own spotless robe of perfect righteousness. And upon the merit of the blood and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, sinners are saved from hell, saved from the wrath of God, saved from a lost eternity, saved to be with Christ forever and forever. O oh God, we thank thee for this so great salvation, so full, so rich, and so free. Help us here tonight to preach Christ and him crucified. May Christ be evidently set forth before the eyes of men and women. And we pray that some dear soul will look on to thee, look on to Jesus Christ alone, trust in Jesus Christ alone, believe in Jesus Christ alone, receive Jesus Christ alone as their very own and personal Savior. Bless us tonight around the cross, we pray, for we ask it all in Jesus' name and for Christ's sake. Amen. The hymn 215, uh, this is a great hymn of testimony. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. The hymn 215, and again we'll stand together as we sing unto the Lord.
Amen. You may be seated. We're turning in God's Word this evening again to the book of Psalms and to the Psalm number 51. The Psalm number 51. And the title of the psalm to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And of course, this is a psalm of repentance. It is David's psalm of broken heartedness over his sin, godly sorrowing over his sin. And of course, he prayed this prayer to God and then he put it into this great hymn uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We are taught to sing our prayers and we're taught to pray our hymns uh, when you go through the book of Psalms. And we should do that when we sing. And uh, I'm not saying we should always do it when we pray. Uh, no one would want to listen to me in public sing my prayers, I'm sure. Uh, but the Lord would accept them through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but this is a tremendous truth. Remember Paul and Silas? Uh, when they were imprisoned, and at midnight we read where they prayed, and uh, they sang hymns. And in the original it says they hymned their prayers, or they prayed their hymns. And it's good to make our hymns true prayers and offer them to God. And if you can, it's good to sing your prayers as well. Uh, but here in Psalm 51, uh, David prays to the Lord uh, this great prayer of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he cries, verse 1, Have mercy, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. This morning we were thinking upon the beauty of the Lord. And here we see something of the beauty of God's mercy, the beauty of God's loving kindness. And we pray that we will see something afresh of the love of Christ for sinners, for you and for me, as we come to meditate upon Christ and him crucified. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure on Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Amen. We know God will add his own divine blessing to the public reading 
of his holy and his precious word. We're going to take up the offering for the work of God at this stage. We'll turn to the hymn 224. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We were singing or reading in that psalm, uh, verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And of course, in the Old Testament, they had the ceremonial law, and that ceremonial cleansing, which was a picture of cleansing in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They took the blood of the sacrifice, the slain animal, uh, they dipped a bunch of the hyssop in the blood, they sprinkled the blood, and that was a picture of cleansing in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of bulls and goats uh, could never take away sin, but it did point David and the Old Testament saints to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Redeemer, the coming of Christ, the Lamb of God, who would shed his blood and die upon the cross to wash us from our sin. And David looked beyond the hyssop, he looked beyond the sign, he looked beyond the symbol of the animal sacrifice, the blood of animals, and he looked to the coming of Christ. His eyes, the eyes of faith, beheld Christ, the sacrifice for sin. And David was trusting in Christ when he said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. What can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And this hymn asks the question, have you been? Have you been? Think upon the words of the hymn. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? We'll just keep our seats as we sing this hymn together in our worship of the Lord. Stand together as we sing the final verse, verse 4, along with the chorus, lay aside the garments that are stained by sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 4 with the chorus. Amen. You may be seated. We're turning again to the psalm we read earlier, Psalm 51. And we're not going to go through the whole psalm, but really the whole psalm is our text tonight. And we trust that God will bless our meditation and lead us afresh to Calvary, and that we might gaze through this psalm upon the person, upon the work 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, our great Redeemer and our Savior. But let's bow together for prayer and ask God's blessing upon the preaching of his word this evening. Our gracious God and our eternal Father in heaven, we do thank thee for the scriptures of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And we thank thee for the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. We thank thee that the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Emmaus, he opened up the scriptures, in particular the scriptures of the Old Testament, and he showed those two discouraged disciples his sufferings and his glory, saying, Ought not Christ to have suffered and to have entered into his glory? We do rejoice that from Genesis right through the Old Testament into the New, right through to the last book, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, God shows us the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. We thank thee for this Psalm 51, and we do pray as we come to meditate upon these words, the words of a real sinner saved by God's amazing grace, the words of a real backslider restored by God's amazing grace. We pray that in this psalm, thou again would reveal Christ to our hearts. Lord, forbid that we should come and go from the house of God without a fresh glimpse of the glory, the glorious beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from before the foundation of the world. Speak to hearts, we pray. Encourage the saints of God. Restore the backslidden in heart. And save sinners by thy grace. For we ask it in thy name and for thy sake. Amen. As we pointed out this morning in our study of God's word, uh, King David was, of course, a man after God's own heart. As a young man, David came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He passed from spiritual death to new life in the Savior, and he became one of the greatest men of God that has ever lived uh, for the glory and honor of the Savior's name. In many ways, David was uh, one of God's mighty men. He was certainly the champion of the people of Israel, the people of God. You will remember that time when Goliath, the giant of Gath, was blaspheming the name of the Lord. And of course, the Israelites were trembling with fear, and no man had the courage nor the ability, really, to go forth and do battle with Goliath. And then, of course, in the providence of God, David came upon the scene, and David, in the power of the Holy Spirit, went forth and he slew the giant. It was indeed a miraculous victory, and he toppled the champion of the enemy with a sling and with a stone. And he did that in the power of Almighty God. David is one of the great heroes of the faith. And as you read his life, especially as you read through the Psalms of David, you discover he went through many trials, many tribulations. He passed through deep, dark valley experiences just like you and I as believers uh, pass through in our day, in our generation. And the Psalms are one of the most encouraging books in the Bible. And there's much there to teach us about the Christian life and about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But having said all that, even though David was truly a child of God, born again of God's Spirit, a man after God's own heart as the Holy Ghost himself testifies. Yet when we come to this psalm, we are reminded of one of the darkest times in the life of God's child, King David. It was a time of backsliding. It was a time of great sin. And we all do well when we think we are standing for God to take heed lest we fall. And this Psalm 51 is certainly a warning to every believer, to every man or woman who is living out and out for God. 
We are still sinners at best. We still have a battle with indwelling sin. There is a spiritual war going on within the child of God. We struggle against the lust of the flesh. We do battle day by day, not only with the world, not only with our arch adversary, the devil, but with our own flesh. And we must never underestimate the power of indwelling sin. It is vital that you and I keep very close to God, that we draw near to the Lord day by day in prayer, in the study of his word, that we might be strengthened to do battle with the world, with the flesh, and with the devil. Here we have a, a sad occasion in the life of this great man of God when he fell not merely into sin, but into scandalous sin, into the sin of adultery, and even into the sin of murder. When Israel was at war, David was at home, and he spied this very attractive woman, a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And she was, of course, the wife of another man. She was the wife of one of David's faithful soldiers, one of David's faithful servants, a man by the name of Uriah the Hittite. And Uriah was away at war, fighting the Lord's battles in the name of King country and of God and David he was not away at war but rather he saw this woman and he yielded to temptation and he brought her to himself he went into her and he committed adultery a vile immoral wicked sinful thing to do. And as a result of that immoral relationship with another man's wife, Bathsheba, she became pregnant. She was found to be with child. And no doubt she came to David and she broke this news to him that would have shaken David, I'm sure, to his very foundation. Now he would be found out his adulterous life would be exposed. His testimony would be in ruins. He would bring disgrace to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would give occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. And so in a panic, David decides to do all he possibly can to cover his sin. And in an effort, a hell-inspired effort to cover his adultery, David urgently recalled Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, back from the war, back home, hoping, of course, that Uriah the Hittite would go to his own home, go to his own bed, and that the world would think the child that Bathsheba would soon bear would be... Uriah's offspring and not David's child. But of course, Uriah the Hittite, if you know the biblical record, you will know that he was an honorable man and that Uriah refused to go to his own bed when his brethren in arms were on the battlefield, sleeping rough, Intense in danger of imminent death. And so he slept at the king's door that night. And so David was still in this great dilemma. How could he possibly cover up his sin? And so he has Uriah the Hittite sent back to the battlefield with a secret message for the captain of the army that Uriah would be sent to the hottest, the most dangerous part of the conflict, where he would be certain to be killed. And to make sure that he was killed, the secret message meant that Uriah would be abandoned. 
forsaken by the army, along with other men as well who would be sacrificed in an effort to cover David's sin. And of course, all went according to David's plan. And Uriah the Hittite was slain, killed in battle, laying down his life for David, the very man who had taken his wife and committed adultery with her. When news was brought to David of Uriah's death, David took Bathsheba to be his wife as quickly as he possibly could, and David married the widow, and she became one of David's multiple wives, all in this diabolical effort to conceal, to cover up David's sin. But of course, no matter how we may try in this world to hide our sin from family, from friends, Uh, from neighbors, no matter how we try to cover our sin from man, we cannot ever cover our sin from God. There is nothing hidden from the eyes of God with whom you and I have to do. He is the all-seeing, the all-knowing God. He knows our every action. He knows our every word. He knows our every thought. Even the thoughts, the secret thoughts of the deepest recess of the heart, the soul, the mind. God knows absolutely everything about you. God knows absolutely everything about me. And God certainly knew absolutely everything about David. And so God sent his servant, the preacher, the prophet Nathan, to confront David, the king, face to face. And that was no small task even for the prophet of God. The king could very easily have had Nathan put to death to silence him, again in an effort to cover his sin. But God sent Nathan the prophet with this message to King David to expose David's sin. There was no indication that David was backslidden here. It seems he was just going about his Christian life as normal as far as others were concerned. Uh, There's no evidence of David losing sleep over his sin. No evidence of a tormented conscience or being perplexed by guilt day after day. Until in a moment, Nathan comes face to face, eyeball to eyeball. And he says to David, thou art the man. We have the historical record back in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And in verse 9 of that uh, chapter, Nathan says to David, thou hast killed. Even though David had not personally taken a sword or a knife and pressed it into the body of Uriah the Hittite, God held him responsible. God held David guilty. And God put these words into the mouth of Uriah that they would pierce, or into the mouth of Nathan, that they would pierce deep into the heart of David. And Nathan says, Thou hast killed. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. And hast taken his wife, his wife, to be thy wife. And suddenly and violently David's conscience is awakened. This word from the preacher hit David like a freight train. David thought he had concealed his tracks well that he had gotten away with adultery, that he had gotten away with sin, that he had gotten away with murder. That the scandal would never see the light of day. That the skeleton would never be dragged out of the shadowy darkness of the closet. But now in a moment, all of a sudden, it was public knowledge. If David had lived in our day, 
The tabloid press would be having a field day. The papers would be flying off the shelves. The news would be viral. The local community would be ablaze. Did you hear? Did you hear about David and Bathsheba? This was a day of great shame. God said David had given occasion to the enemies of Christ to blaspheme the name of God. It was a day of disgrace. And David was broken hearted. The word of God turned David into a broken man. Broken over his sin. Overwhelmed with guilt. Overwhelmed with shame. Overwhelmed with disgrace. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, David cries out with this broken and contrite heart that he writes about in Psalm 51. And he cries from the depths of his broken heart, his contrite soul, I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. And here in Psalm 51, God opens up the broken heart of David, the contrite heart of David, and God shows us something of David's godly sorrow over his sin. David's overwhelming agony of guilt and shame is revealed in this Psalm 51 for our learning. Here is an example of real, genuine repentance. And I know repentance is something that is rarely preached on in our day and generation. Even from so-called evangelical pulpits. Men and women do not want to be called or commanded to repent. God now commands all men. It's not an option. It is the command of God. God now commands all men everywhere to repent. And if you do not repent, if you have not repented, if you will not repent, you live in defiance of God and of his word. But repentance is the way to true peace. And here David with his guilty conscience tormenting him. He knows the only way to have peace. A conscience that is at peace. A conscience that is quiet. Is to repent and he knows the only way to have peace with God is to repent. And so God has recorded this psalm for our learning and to remind us of the great gospel truth, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And so for a few moments as we bring this meeting to a close, I want to think upon this Great gospel necessity of repentance unto Jesus Christ. Now notice here, first of all, David took full responsibility for his sin. I wonder, before we go any further, have you ever done that? Have you ever personally taken full responsibility for your sin? David did not point at his circumstances. And make excuses for his sin. He didn't even point at Bathsheba. And blame her for his sin. Remember in the garden when man fell into sin. And God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the voice of the Lord God, the word of God, Jesus Christ, came into the garden and confronted Adam. What have you done? And Adam says, well, the woman you gave me. 
Men like to blame their wives for a lot of things. Uh, and that goes right, right back to the Garden of Eden. And uh, Adam, he was going to blame his wife for his fall into sin. And then the Lord said to Eve, what have you done? And she, of course, points the finger at the devil. And people like to blame the devil for everything. And certainly the devil is far from being squeaky clean. And he'll answer for his own sin. But you and I need to own our sin. And this is what David did. Uh, David owns his sin. Look there at verse 1. At the end of that verse, David confessed his own guilt. He prayed there about my my transgressions. Again, if you look at verse 2, David talks there about my sin. Again in verse 3, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Again in verse 4, against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Verse 9 again, David speaks of my sins and all mine iniquities. In verse 14, David confesses his guilt and he refers to it there as blood guiltiness. And again, I ask you tonight, have you really truly owned your guilt? Have you owned your sin? That is a vital and essential part of true, genuine gospel repentance. You need to own your guilt. You need to own your sin. You may not have committed physical adultery like David had been guilty of. You may not be guilty of physically killing or uh, murdering men, women, and children. Though that is a possibility. God knows, doesn't he? And they're met in this country and they think they've got off with murder, but God knows. And the judgment day is coming. And there are men in this country and they think they've got away with adultery, but God knows. But you may not have committed crimes of that particular nature in a physical way, but nonetheless... Every man, every woman, whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, we are all guilty of sin. Here's one thing at least that we all have in common. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's not even a just man, the Bible says, a saved man, a justified man, a believer in Jesus Christ. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Every man, woman, every young person here tonight in this meeting house, all who are watching online. We need to own our guilt. We need to confess our sin. Your sin and my sin needs to be forgiven by God. Your sin, my sin needs to be washed away. Forever washed away. By the power of Jesus' precious blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, the blood of the God-man, blood of infinite value, blood of eternal worth, blood that can satisfy the infinite justice of an infinitely holy God, there is nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ that can wash away your sin and give the guilty conscience real peace now and in eternity. You cannot afford to live another day without owning your guilt, bringing your sin to Christ and confessing your sins to God. You turn in your Bible to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, and keep in mind uh, the Apostle John here is writing to the church. He's writing to believers. 
He's writing to Christians. He's writing to those who have the experience of the new birth. To those who are born again from above. They have new life in Jesus Christ. They have life more abundant. They have life everlasting. They're never going to be in hell. They are saved by God's amazing grace. And they're saved with an everlasting salvation. But here John points to their sins. The sin of the church. The sin of the believer in Jesus Christ. Because we all continue to sin. There's not a man or a woman here. You think of the, the, the best, the finest, the holiest Christian you know. There's not a man or woman who is saved, who loves God perfectly. In all your Christian life, you have never loved God perfectly. And I'll go further and say, you've never loved your neighbor perfectly. And there are the two great commandments upon which the entire law of God hangs. If you do not keep those commandments, then you're guilty of breaking all the commandments. You have never loved the Lord as you should. I have never loved the Lord as the Lord deserves to be loved by me. I sin every day, every moment of the day. I fall short of that glorious standard. Thank God Jesus Christ came and he did for me what I could never do for myself. He loved God perfectly. He loved his neighbor perfectly. He obeyed God perfectly. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He always did those things that pleased his father in heaven perfectly. And the moment I came to Jesus Christ for salvation, not only did he wash away my sin, but he gave to me, the Bible term is, he imputed unto me. Romans 5 tells us of the gift of righteousness. Christ gave me the gift of his righteousness. So that in the eyes of God, God looks upon me as he looks upon Christ, as if I'd never sinned, as if I'd always perfectly obeyed him. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I'm cleansed in the blood of Christ. Accepted in the beloved. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'll never be in hell. But only because of the merit of Christ. Only because of the merit of his blood and his righteousness. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. My beauty are my glorious dress. That is the only reason God will accept me into heaven when I die. The blood and the righteousness, the merit of Jesus Christ. Yes, you who are born again, you've been saved. I trust you're living a holy life, but it's an imperfect life. We sin every day. There's not a day that goes by when you and I do not need to ask God for his forgiveness. Not a day. Remember how the Lord taught us to pray. Matthew 6 verse 12, forgive us. In the same breath, give us this day our daily bread. The idea, the implication is here's a prayer we need to pray every day. Every day we need to come to God for forgiveness. It is repeated again in Luke 11 verse 4. Forgive us our sins. The child of God needs to pray that every day. There is not a day in 2024 when you will not have great cause to pray that prayer with all your heart before the Lord. And if that is true of the Christian, what of you who are not yet saved? You're sinning every day against God. Your sins have never been forgiven. You've never asked God to forgive your sin. You've never come as David came, confessing your sin, owning your guilt, crying to God for mercy. You're still in your sin. And if you were to die tonight, you would go to a Christ rejecter's hell and you'd go to hell forever.
Here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, we read, If we say that we have no sin. Who would say that? I hope nobody here tonight would say that. Who would possibly say, I have no sin? And yet there are people in the world, and if they were sitting where you're sitting tonight, they would argue with the preacher. Some people just like to argue with the preacher. And yet when it's God's preacher and he's preaching God's word, they need to realize they're arguing with God, and they're arguing with God's word, and I hope that's uh, never the case here. But there are those who would say, well, I am not a sinner. Because they have no idea about the holiness of God that we were looking at this morning. The glorious holiness of God. And they have no idea about the exceeding sinfulness of their sin. But there are even some professing Christians. And I've met some and they've told me, well, I have not sinned today. And they said, I haven't sinned this week. I haven't sinned this month. Indeed, they would tell me, I can't remember the last time I sinned. There are some people that will actually tell you that. But of course, they are wrong. Because God says here in his word, 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If you think you have no sin, sin that is worthy of the wrath of God, sin that is worthy of everlasting punishment in the torments of an endless hell. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Would you call God a liar? If you're sitting tonight thinking to yourself, well, I'm not such a bad chap, I'm not such a bad girl. I'm, I'm maybe not perfect, but I, I, certainly I look at my life and if you want to call my faults, my flaws, my mistakes, sins, well, well, they're not sins that would deserve to be punished in hell forever. If that's what you think about yourself, if that's what you think about your sin, you're deceiving yourself, you're deluding yourself, and you're calling God a liar. Your sin, the least of your sins. Deserve the pains and the wrath of God in hell forever and forever and forever and forever without end. And the only reason you're not in hell already is the grace and the mercy of God. The wages of sin is death. The day is coming when men, women, body and soul will be plunged into the lake of fire, the second death. That's what your sin, my sin deserves for eternity. And your only hope, my only hope, is the mercy of God. The grace of God, the amazing grace of God. We're all sinners in this house tonight. Some are saved by grace, some are not saved. But we're all sinners. We all are in need of God's forgiveness this evening. We all have cause to repent. As David repented in this Psalm 51. 1 John 1, 9, if you have it open still, assures us, if we confess our sin, this is what David is doing in this Psalm. And God takes that Psalm and he takes this verse, 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. This is what God will do for you. If you do what David did, come to God with a broken and a contrite heart, with godly sorrow in your soul, sorrowing over your sin, repent, turn from your sin, confess your sin to Christ. The Bible says, God assures us in his word, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just. God can justly forgive your sin. How can Christ forgive your sin and mine? Well, because Christ has paid for the sins of his people upon the cross. When Christ hung in agony upon that middle tree, he took my sins, my sorrows, he made them his very own. 
He bore my burden to Calvary. He suffered and died alone. And I can say with the hymn writer, my sin, my sin not in part but the whole, all of my sins, my past sins, my present sins, the sins I'll commit in the future, my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to his cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How can your sin be washed away? How can you be cleansed whiter than the snow? We'll look at verse 7 in closing. The blood. The child of God will never tire of hearing this message. The child of God will never grow weary hearing about the power of Jesus' precious blood. Any man or woman who feels the guilt of sin, the shame of sin, will rejoice to hear this over and over and over and over and over again every day of their lives. The blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth. It keeps on cleansing. It cleanseth us from all sin. Are you trusting in the blood of Christ tonight? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? David certainly trusted in the blood. Psalm 51 verse 2, wash me throughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. He was looking to the blood of Christ. Real repentance brings the sinner to the blood of Christ. That we might have peace with God. Peace with God. There's no other way. If you want peace with God tonight, it can only be had through the blood of the Savior's cross. Will you look to Christ tonight? Trust in Christ tonight. Turn from your sin tonight. Confess your sins to God. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's bow together for prayer. Our meeting is over. We're not going to sing a closing hymn. Time has got the better of us again. Uh, but I'm in no rush home. Now, if you're concerned about your soul, no matter how long it takes, even to the wee hours of the morning, please wait behind. Come speak to me. It will be my privilege to open the Bible with you and point you to the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. But you don't need me. Right now where you sit in your seat, you can repent from your sin, confess your sins to God, and Jesus Christ will come into your heart, wash you, cleanse you, purge you, make you whiter than the snow. You can leave this house rejoicing, rejoicing in God's salvation through faith. In Jesus' precious blood. Let's bow together and let's all pray. Our Father and our God, we do thank thee for this time around the foot of the old rugged cross. We thank thee for the privilege of sitting at the Master's feet and hearing thy word. And we thank thee for this glorious message of the gospel that sinners, the vilest sinner, who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. There's peace for the guilty sinner, for the broken and the contrite heart, the troubled soul, the troubled conscience. There's peace for men and women through the blood of our Savior's cross. Bring some man, woman, in repentance and in faith to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their very own and personal Savior tonight. And we do pray that some precious soul will leave this house rejoicing in God's salvation so full, so rich, and so free. Part us now in thy fear 
and with thy blessing, abiding upon each and every one who knows and loves the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and in truth. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and for Christ's sake. Amen and amen. Thank you.